Well, friends, here we are in the third week of Advent, and during these uh, last few weeks, weeks of Advent, uh, I've been going through the, the characters in this nativity scene. Uh, I shared with you during the, the first Sunday of Advent as we were decorating the, the sanctuary that, that the uh, nativity scene is, is one of those symbols that is my, my favorite. It's, uh, for me, it was a way for this story to kind of be more realistic than just a fairy tale as I could look in the, the faces of these characters and as I could touch them and as I could kind of play with them. The story became real for me. Last week we talked a little bit about Mary, and we, we talked about Mary in terms of the two Marys that exist kind of within the church. The, the Mary that seems to be the kind of meek and mild uh, little girl who, who is really unsure of what is happening, and the Mary that Scripture gives us, the Mary that sings a song when she hears that Jesus is going to be born, that she is going to give birth to this baby boy that will change the world. And we read that, uh, that wonderful song that she, she uh, erupts into. It's called the Magnificat. And we saw this image of this little girl who becomes a woman in this place and, and begins to, to celebrate and rejoice what God is doing and finds herself in a place ready to take on Herod and Caesar because she understands that her baby boy is coming up and the powers and corruption of the world are coming down and she's excited and she is ready to go and she has this very different image than at least I was raised with for Mary. Today, I want to talk about this guy, Joseph. Now, Joseph is kind of a secondary character in this story. As I kind of grew up uh, uh, hearing the, the story of Christmas and the nativity story, Joseph for me was kind of the guy who was uh, like limousine and transportation service and lodging. That was kind of what Joseph's job was. And he wasn't particularly good at that either, right? I mean, he figures out he'll get a donkey for, for Mary to ride on their way to, to Bethlehem, but when he gets to Bethlehem, there's no place for them to stay. So he, he didn't do that. I can kind of picture Mary saying, you had one job, one job right? Joseph kind of kind of blends into the barn, so to speak, in, in the nativity story. When I was a pastor of another church years ago, we had a Christmas play in which the kids would come and they would reenact the nativity scene, and we had the preschoolers dressed up like sheep and goats and donkeys, and that they would all come in on their hands and knees, and everybody would go, oh, you're so cute. My daughter Adeline was a sheep. I have a picture on my desk of her dressed as a sheep. And so we had the preschoolers come in as, as, uh, as the, the, the farm animals. We had the early elementary school kids come in as shepherds, right? And so we had them all dressed in, in uh, bathrobes and uh, dish towels on their heads. And we gave them PVC pipes that we had bent to look like uh, uh, shepherds crooks, right? And so they came in as, as shepherds. And then we had uh, a couple um, from our older elementary school uh, age kids who were Mary and Joseph. And then we had uh, this old rubber doll from the 1950s that looked kind of creepy. If you didn't see him wrapped in swaddling clothes, uh, he would give you nightmares, really. He was pretty, pretty scary. His eyes would roll back in his head when you laid it back, right? <laughs> but we wrapped him up so you couldn't tell all that, but uh, that was safer than a real child that we sometimes decided to use and decided that was not, um, that was a, that's a whole different sermon illustration. But... Have that already, and, and had the whole thing with songs that we're going to sing, and kids were going to march down the aisle, and we were all going to say how cute and wonderful it was. And so the, uh, uh, one of the Sunday school teachers was kind of in charge of this production, and lo and behold, Sunday morning when we're supposed to do the big Christmas cantata, we get a call that Joseph is sick, uh, that Joseph is not going to be there, and it is too late for us to make any changes. And so I'm sitting in my office getting ready for, for worship service, and the, the Sunday school teacher comes in and tells me what's going on. She says, what are we going to do? We don't have a Joseph. And so we sat down and we thought for a little bit. And Karen, who was the uh, um, uh, Sunday school uh, teacher in charge of the program, said, well, you know, he doesn't really do much. We could just write him out. We could just write him out of the script. And it's getting to be 20 minutes until worship starts, and the kids are still are over in the sanctuary kind of rehearsing and going through their things. And I was like, well, okay, let's do it. 
So we went over and we grabbed the kids and, and we kind of ran through the entry of everybody coming up into the stage and, and taking their positions and we just did it without Joseph. And you know what? We didn't miss him. Didn't even notice he wasn't there. And so as I was sitting in the back and as I was sitting with Karen in the pew and we were kind of watching everything as the kids were singing their song and Mary was there front and center holding the creepy baby Jesus in her arms and nobody missed Joseph at all. But we both kind of looked at each other and we said, we got to have Joseph. Joseph's got to be here somewhere, right? So we decided that we would grab one of the shepherds and we changed his robe from a gray robe to a brown robe because Joseph always wears brown, right? And we took away his stick, and so we put a different colored dish towel on his head, and although Joseph, because he was uh, in first grade and Mary was in fifth grade, Joseph was about two and a half feet shorter than Mary, <laughs> but we said, okay, walk in front of this paper mache donkey in front of Mary and the doll, walk up here and stand right there. And he did it, and it went off without a hitch. That's kind of my picture of Joseph in the nativity. We could just as easily write him out of the story if we didn't find some kid to play, to play his place, right? He's kind of one of those characters that just seems to, to be there. You know, in the nativity story, in scripture, Joseph doesn't say a single word in the whole thing. He doesn't say one thing. I, I find it fascinating that the 15-year-old the, the girl who's going to be mother of Jesus, who is carrying such a burden, erupts in song. It turns into a musical. It's like Hamilton all of a sudden when she gets this message from Jesus, uh, that Jesus is going to be born. When Joseph gets this message of what is happening, he doesn't say a word. Not even a, yep. I mean, nothing. We don't get any lines from him. But even though he doesn't say a word, his actions speak incredibly loud. Uh, I want this morning to kind of, in a sense, redeem Joseph. I want us to, to look at Joseph maybe in a different way, that he is not somebody who just fades back into the barn in our, our picture of the nativity, that he is not somebody that we can just write out of the Christmas play. In fact, I would venture to say, over the last few years, I've come to realize that Joseph, the father of Jesus, is probably, if not the, one of the most important characters in the New Testament. I mean, if you get by the whole Jesus thing, right? I mean, look, look at this story as it unfolds. We have, have Joseph and, and tradition. There's lots of traditions about who Joseph is and what he's like. And, and uh, you know, uh, traditionally, most Bible scholars believe that Joseph was considerably older than the, the woman that he was engaged to and ultimately married in Mary. And we don't hear anything about Joseph after Jesus is 12 years old and there's that story where uh, Jesus, or, uh, Jesus and his family go to the temple, right? And as he, they uh, go back home and they leave Jesus behind. Again, not a great transportation story for Joseph, right? But after that, we don't hear about Joseph anymore in Scripture. Most scholars believe that by the time Jesus was an adult and was uh, moving into the, the place of his ministry that Joseph probably wasn't alive anymore. But historically, uh, those of us at least in the Protestant tradition believe that Mary and Joseph had other children, uh, namely James and Jude were uh, Jesus' brothers and they wrote books that are included in our New Testament as part of our sacred scripture. But in this story of Joseph, we have Joseph, this, this man who has a, probably an arranged marriage to this young woman, and as things are going along just fine, he gets a message from Mary that she is pregnant, or if we have sensitive sensibilities, she's with child, right? And according to the law, I mean, I, I know that this is a long time ago, but they know how that happens, right? They know how babies come about. And, and according to the law, the law says that Joseph has been insulted, and not only has Joseph been insulted by this, but his whole family has been insulted. There's all kinds of things in the law of Moses, and as it's been interpreted over the centuries, all kinds of things that Joseph can do about the situation because he's been insulted that the woman he's engaged to is having a child, obviously, by someone that is not him. One of the options is that he, he has no right or he has no uh, a duty to marry her anymore. 
the engagement is off at this point. He has no duty to support her. Her family has no duty to support her because she is a sinful woman. If he wants to, it is fully within his rights in the law to have her stoned to death. Even if he doesn't want to have her stoned to death or, or murdered for this transgression, if, her fa- if his family believes that they have been insulted enough by her actions, his family can order that she be stoned to death. That's option one. Option two is that he can quietly do the, the legal things that need to happen for this wedding to be called off. He can let her just go and deal with whatever it is that she has to deal with and have no, responsible, uh, no responsibility for her and just quietly make this go away. And that is what he chooses to do. He decides that I will just quietly finish, uh, end this, uh, this engagement. She will fend for herself. She'll do whatever she has to do to survive. And we will just call it quits. And when Joseph makes that decision... That night, he has that dream in which a messenger from God comes and explains the whole thing, that, there's, that this child is born of the Holy Spirit, that this child is the one who's going to be the, the one that they've been waiting for, the one who will save his people from their sins. And when Joseph wakes up, he bursts into song. No, he doesn't burst into song. He doesn't say a word. But he does something. Actually, he doesn't do something. He says, okay, and, and he marries, goes ahead and, and marries Mary. And then the story unfolds as the census is taking place, and, and he has to go, and, and he has to go and, and lead them to a place where they have to sign an oath to Caesar and be part of a census that is taking place. And they get there, and there's no room for them at the inn. And that is a whole other uh, sermon. There are so many explanations to why nobody would let them stay. But whatever the reason, they aren't offered the hospitality that everybody else is offered. And they are in, in the back in, in a, a setting that is fit for animals. And the time comes for Mary to give birth. And Joseph is there watching over, making sure everything is safe and secure. And then he becomes the father of Jesus. I have a, a really good friend who was a Catholic priest in Bonners Ferry. And, and uh, Catholic theology has a whole lot of things about Mary and uh, the Holy Family and all those things, which I don't particularly subscribe to. But one of the things in Roman Catholicism is that they believe Jesus was born without sin. And in order for Jesus to be born without sin, Mary can't have any sin either because of, of that whole uh, uh, original sin thing. And so they have a, a, a theological standing that Mary, in an immaculate conception, was full of grace and that she does not have sin either. And so he, in a conversation I had with him one time, he said, can you imagine what it was like to be Joseph? Joseph is the only one who's not perfect in this family. I mean, Jesus is without sin, and if you subscribe to a Roman Catholic idea, Mary is without sin, so anytime something's wrong, whose fault is it going to be? You can only imagine what that's like. But Joseph is put in this position of protecting this family. Joseph is in this position where not only does he get the knowledge of what is happening, but he has the faith to, uh, to understand what is happening and to act upon it. And he has the compassion to see it fulfilled. I mean, Joseph could have finished this story right at the beginning. We could have never got to page two of this story. Joseph could have decided to to exercise his full potential in the law and put this to an end and the story would have finished really quickly. If it were a sitcom, it would have lasted about two and a half minutes, right? But Joseph doesn't because he has the understanding of what is happening. He has the faith to believe what is happening and he has then the compassion to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to do what the Holy Spirit does in this story to bring about the most important historical event that I believe humanity's ever seen. Because Joseph does that, this story unfolds. 
We sometimes try to, to diminish Joseph and, and, and diminish his role in Jesus' life because, after all, Jesus was the, the Son of God, and he had this divine understanding about all those things, and so we kind of push Joseph further back into the barn, and we kind of discount his role in Jesus' life. But in this culture, the one who would have stole, told, uh, told the stories of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Israel and taught his sons the stories of what it was to be the chosen people of God and what that meant for them in the world today. Who was the one that would tell those stories? It was Joseph. Joseph must have been pretty good at it because his other two boys, James and, and Jude, both wrote, uh, past, wrote letters that we believed were divinely inspired and are included in our sacred scriptures. He had an incredible role. He was the one who protected his family. Joseph was the one who, in another dream, after his baby boy, after this baby boy was born, gets a dream that King Herod is coming to kill his son. And Joseph, again, doesn't say a word. He believes that what God has told him is true, has the faith to believe that there's something bigger going on in the world, and he makes the decision with his wife to flee to Egypt, the place where their ancestors were slaves centuries ago. He picks up his family because he believes he's unsafe and that his own government is willing to kill him and goes to another land to try to find security and peace. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And he and his family leave as refugees and have to live in hiding. Then later he gets another dream from a messenger of God that says, Herod is dead, it's safe to go home. And they go home and they carry on their life again like every refugee hopes and prays will happen. I mean, Joseph was the one who protected this family. Without Joseph, this story doesn't exist. Without Joseph, there is no birth in the manger. If Joseph had said, had argued with the messenger of God and said, well, you know what the law says and the law that you gave to Moses, the law that you gave to us says that I've been insulted and here's what the law says, but the Holy Spirit tells him something different and he has enough faith to act on it. If he doesn't do that, Christmas doesn't happen. If he doesn't do that, none of us are sitting here. If he doesn't do that, the miraculous nature of God becoming human to show us the way that leads to life doesn't happen. I mean, the story of Christmas starts with grace, doesn't it? And Joseph is the one who bestows that grace. He could have said, what I deserve, what the law tells me is this, but instead he says, I'll do it. And he quietly goes about working for the Holy Spirit to change the world through this little child that's being born in a manger. Without Joseph, Christmas doesn't happen. Without Joseph, the blind man that is healed stays blind. With, without Joseph, the woman caught in adultery dies in the streets. Without Joseph, the men who are cured of leprosy are still unclean. Without Joseph, there's no disciples. Without Joseph, there's no New Testament. Without Joseph, there's no empty tomb. Without Joseph, this story never gets off the ground. And so I hope that when we look at this picture of the nativity and we see all of these characters here, that we don't see Joseph as just the guy in charge of transportation and lodging, but that Joseph plays this pivotal role that without Joseph, this New Testament doesn't unfold. Without Joseph, we don't understand who Jesus is. And without Joseph, we don't see the transformation of the world that happens because the Savior of the world is born. Without Joseph, the Savior of the world dies on the end of a sword from a tyrant named Herod. But because Joseph understood what was happening, because Joseph was able to hear the Holy Spirit and act upon it, we can celebrate 
and rejoice, and he plays a pivotal role in our history and who we are as people of love and of compassion. And I pray that as we see this story unfold for us in this season of Advent, that we realize something miraculous is happening because God is with us. Amen?